breadbasket is disappearing. Climate change and decades of overexploitation is resulting in the growth of a huge desert. Is it possible to stop the expansion of the Sahara on the Danube? Something like this has no reason to exist. In 50, maybe 100 years, Bucharest will also be covered with sand. Can this still be prevented? We are in an ongoing race with the sand and climate change. Octavian Berchanu is an environmental activist and opposition politician from Bucharest. His mission is to stymie the expansion of the desert and prevent his homeland from becoming desolate. This forestry expert fights nonstop for his cause, sacrificing both his private life and his career. He even confronts the mafia when necessary. Octavian is driven because around him, the desert in Romania is expanding. And due to climate change, the situation gets worse and worse every year. Desertification across Europe and in Romania doesn't mean only uh, sands on the ground, sand on the ground, but only losing vegetation, trees and things like this. Behind you can see uh, landfill, the highest structure in Bucharest, and we lost our vegetation here, it was a forest in the past, now become a desert without tree, just uh, shrubs and things like this. Octavian has identified two culprits that are responsible for turning the outskirts of Bucharest into sandy plains, illegal garbage dumps and deforestation. Planting trees helps prevent the sand from advancing further. Lots of trees. Gorilla planting is what Octavian and his helpers call what they do, reforestation without official permission. The work is arduous. Every time when I'm arriving here, I'm, we are Don Quixotes. Uh, we have to fight a lot to maintain biodiversity in this area, to maintain a wetland here, because it was a wetland. And uh, we try to plant trees thousands and thousands of trees on that hill, of garbage hill, in this place, and to keep animals and birds together in the best possible way. The sand at this garbage dump has traveled 200 kilometers. A desert is growing here that is already 800 square kilometers in size. The sand travels as far as Bucharest, other European countries, including Spain, Portugal, and Greece, have a problem with desertification, too. Octavian is determined to find a way to counteract it. As a member of parliament for Romania's third strongest party, Save Romania Union, Octavian walks through the corridors of power. He has far more influence now as an elected official than he did when he was solely an environmental activist. Today, he's known far beyond Bucharest. Concerned citizens from all across the country send him photos and videos that show the full extent of desertification. This is the desert from the south of Romania. We saw this uh, Sahara landscape. Actually, uh, this year was a rainy one, but this is an ordinary landscape in the south of Romania. You see a lot of storm of wind, wind that is uh, bringing a lot of air pollution across half of Romania. Octavian sets out to the two main sources of encroaching sand, to the region known as Little Wallachia. He has found people there who have taken up the fight to preserve nature. He plans to meet them and later promote their cause in the capital. Octavian is doing pioneering work in small communities in the countryside, ones that are often ignored by the authorities. I go exactly where uh, <clears throat> the authorities and uh, the state is stuck 
and uh, is doing nothing. I started uh, looking on the satellite maps to see the origin of the air pollution. And I saw those points in, uh, on the map and I realized that I have to go there to find actually what happens in the field, to talk with the communities and uh, with uh, all the stakeholders. He doesn't benefit financially from this. On the contrary, it costs him money. Actually, I don't have uh, financial support for what I'm doing. All the money came from my pocket, and my pocket is very small because uh, I'm working uh, for the state. Actually, the state pays me with uh, 200 euros per month as a city councillor. Today, Octavian is pinning his hopes on a forest owner named Dan Popescu. Dan has deeper pockets. He earns his money by selling timber. But these trees have much more than just economic value for the entrepreneur. When I touch this tree, I feel connected to my father. He planted this forest and I continue planting for him, as he's no longer alive. 13,000 hectares were felled in the 1970s for large-scale agricultural projects. It was my father's dream to replant the forest. Not only do I want to fulfill my father's dream, I want to plant even more trees. This part of Wolekia has always been threatened by drought, due to the sandy soil. For centuries, large forests prevented it from becoming a desert. Dan Popescu wants to reverse the clear-cutting of the past. But climate change makes the struggle to rectify previous environmental missteps a race against time. Reforestation not only offers protection from further devastation, it is also a sustainable source of income. These workers earn 18 euros a day for their backbreaking work. That might not sound like much, but it is enough to live on in this region. Many of them previously went abroad as harvest and seasonal workers, but now they are able to make a living here. Dan Popescu plans to plant 100,000 hectares, an area larger than Berlin, Germany. Dan Popescu needs someone with influence in the capital who will campaign for his reforestation plan and ensure the land is his to use. Octavian not only has good contacts in politics. As a former Greenpeace member, he is also well connected in Europe's environmental protection movement. Former mayor Alexandru Dunoyu works on gaining the trust of small farmers and convincing them to give up their plots of land for the forestry project. It's no easy feat. At the start, he had to push hard to win them over. We have 45 years of communism and cooperatives behind us. The people were dispossessed of their land and only had it returned a few years ago. Then we came along, and asked them to make their plots available again. In the first villages we approached, the people were very reluctant. We returned with the mayor and officials from the Ministry of Agriculture to show them we meant what we said. We didn't want to take their fields away from them, we just wanted to work with them. Ten years later, we gave them wood to sell. They gave us sand and we gave them back a forest. We kept our word. We're always available to answer questions. The landowners come to me and ask, why is it like this? How do you explain that? Why did it happen like this? Alexandru Dunoyu also owns a plot of land that he wants to offer to Dan for reforestation. Here, Dan demonstrates how the forest affects the climate. It's relatively cool today, only 30 degrees. But let's see how hot the ground is. 53 degrees. Normally at this time of year, the air temperature is 40 degrees, and the ground is 70 degrees. This summer, it wasn't as hot and sunny as it usually is. 
which is why Alexandru Dunoyu was able to grow watermelons in his field this year. This was an exception to the rule. In the last three summers, nothing grew on this desolate sand in the blazing heat. It's just not possible in places where there are no trees and the land can't be irrigated. Another temperature check, this time in the shade of these fast-growing acacias, planted only a few years ago, just a few meters from the fields. The temperature is dropping. It started at 27 degrees and is now at 23. A 30 degree difference between the forest floor and the open field. After several hot summers, the climate is relatively bearable this year. Is the soil always this wet? Not usually. This summer is different. After many dry years, it's a real exception, as it's rained once almost every week. Everything is usually bare at this time of year. Normally, this would all be parched dry, and you'd see dunes bordering the forest. The sand layer is quite thick here, isn't it? The sand is very deep. I don't know how deep it goes. We dug up two meters once, and there was still sand. We didn't reach any stone. At the end of a long day, Octavian returns to his hotel deep in thought. Not only is he battling the ever-expanding desert, he also has to deal with corrupt officials who do business with the waste mafia. It all takes its toll. This loneliness is painful, first of all, because for a moment you think that you have friends, but uh, when uh, things are going to be uh, much tough than usually, they disappear immediately. It is more difficult to disappear in the middle of the night and share location if something happens, just follow the, this location and uh, search for my body and things like this. I do my best to stay alive, of course, but uh, for others, for my parents, uh, for my family, for my girlfriend, it's very difficult. The uncertain fate of little Wallachia propels him forward. In the former bread basket of Romania, it is now so dry that the yields from wheat and corn harvests are very low. A few fields are still tended to, but only to collect EU subsidies farmers reveal privately. The small town of Dabolina is located in the center of desertification in little Wallachia. The only plant that still thrives here is the watermelon. Not only is the sandy soil ideal, they also need surprisingly little water. What Bordeaux is to French wine, Dabolina is to Romanian melons. But there is a limit to what they can withstand. Entire harvests have withered under the blazing sun. Here too, we can see the effects of climate change. But Octavian suspects that climate change is not the only reason for the devastation. The cause of the desertification goes back much further. Dan introduces him to Ion Spiridon, the mayor of the small community of Urzika, who is at the forefront in the fight against the expanding desert. <laughs> The mayor uses this map to explain to Octavian how the sand spreads from west to east. In 50 to 100 years, the sands will have taken over all of southern Romania. If the desert is not stopped, Bucharest will also be covered. Large oak forests can still be seen on old maps from the 19th century. They were planted by Eon Spiridon's ancestors to protect the soil. The fear of little Wallachia being silted up is not new. The problem has existed here for centuries and centuries. People say this was once a seafloor. A body of water reached up to here, leaving a long chain of dunes. 
About 300 years ago, people noticed that the sandy soil was slippery and planted trees there. They created huge forests, from us here in Urzica to the Zhu Valley. What happened to the forests? The forests were cut down under communism, and the land was used for agriculture. You know how it was back then. In order to gain more farmland, a whole lake was drained in this region, and a complex irrigation system was created. How do the authorities deal with the situation today? The Institute for Agricultural Research in Dabolina is run by the Romanian state. Director Aurelia Diaconu understands that the climate is changing and is conducting research on fruits that can be grown in the sand. We are looking for alternatives, aside from melons, of course. Melons from Dabulini are a trademark, both in Romania and abroad. But we also need to develop new trademarks for the region so that farmers have alternatives in the future. Growing melons is a short-term business. We are trying to teach the farmers to invest in long-term enterprises, for example, in orchards or berry bush plantations. It was from this very building that the state once dictated to farmers what they should plant. Nowadays, the emphasis is on teaching them. Three types of peas, different types of peanuts. We have cultivated all of these here. And this is our traditional wine, Roșiura. This also grows in fairly dry conditions. The Institute has many large fields, which are regularly inspected by Aurelia Diaconu. A wide variety of crops are grown and tested here under the hot sun. For example, Chinese dates, kiwis, peanuts, beans, raspberries, blackberries, and several types of wine. All part of the agricultural program that the Institute runs as they try to adapt to the new conditions, more heat and less rain. We are in an ongoing race with the sand and climate change. That is why we are experimenting here with new irrigation technologies, but above all, with new plant species. Some of them are very promising. We actually have good climatic conditions here. Spring comes very early in this area. We can plant seed potatoes in February and harvest new potatoes as early as April. For Aurelia Diaconu, the expanding desert is actually more of a blessing than a curse. Properly harnessed, sandy soils can yield exceptionally good produce. The aroma of the fruits that grow in sand is stronger than in normal soils. The sugar content is much higher due to the strong sunlight and high temperatures. They give the fruit its flavor, color, and quality. Can the region be saved by embracing climate change and making the best of the desertification? Octavian is seriously considering this approach as well. He wants to discuss it with experts from the World Wildlife Fund. But one thing is certain, growing other fruits will not improve the climate in the area, and the devastation could continue. That's why Yulia Puyu and her assistant Diana Preda from the WWF are focusing on the complete restoration of Little Wallachia. In addition to reforesting, they plan to re-establish a huge lake, one that was drained in the 1970s to make way for farmland. Look, that was a lake. It went on for kilometers in both directions. If the Danube were allowed to flow through its old floodplains again, Lake Putello would also fill up here within a few years.
The WWF already revived this Romanian lake. Large wetlands in the Danube Delta were successfully restored. Here too, natural habitats were destroyed to create farmland. Today, fishery and tourism are flourishing. The combination of plants and humid conditions could secure the sand at Lake Patelu and keep the desert at bay. That is what it could look like here again. Octavian is campaigning for this in Bucharest. Local authorities, however, do not support the project. The state leases large areas of land here to international agricultural corporations. Octavian wants to know who it is that profits from this. He's determined to find out. His activism is well known in Romania. He has tangled with the mafia and organized poachers as well as with corrupt politicians. His projects receive a lot of attention and approval, which both protects him and amplifies his voice. Octavian begins the last leg of his journey. The worst is yet to come. Ravenari is the second epicenter of Romania's desertification. An old coal-fired power plant has supplied the grid for almost 50 years. It's surrounded by refuse from coal mining and the toxic sand has spread far beyond the region. Climate change accelerates the consequences of this environmental pollution. But there is reason for hope. Dinut Dinuka and his son Catalin have been working for years to turn these deadened landscapes into living ecosystems again. Dinut headed the region's forestry office for many years, and his son Catalin has a doctorate in forestry. Both are researching plants that can bring the nature here back to life. Oh my gosh barren, desolate landscape as far as the eye can see. Octavian is speechless at first, then angry. He reminds himself this is exactly why he began this journey. A man-made desert in the middle of an area that is already threatened by drought. And no authority in the whole country seems to care. The adjacent land also looked that desolate once. But with the help of Dinut and Catalin Dinuka, nature has reclaimed the land, so it is possible to revitalize the area. On this gray part, we have an entire landscape covered by ash, hundreds of hectares. On this side, we have an example, a very good example, how nature could cover this land with green. My mission, how is, uh, my mission is how to make people to understand this big picture, how uh, to involve them in uh, ecological re reconstruction and to make them understand that the sand which goes with the air in Bucharest is destroying our body and our lands too and other, uh, our fresh water actually. Here too, the Dinukas have used acacias. They are the first line of defense. Once a healthy layer of humus has formed on the ground in the forests, native trees can be planted again. But how long does that take? So does planting the acacia stabilize the soil? I wrote my doctoral thesis on planting in toxic soils. Acacias are like medicine for these areas. After about 20 to 30 years, you can then replace them with native trees. Father, don't go in that direction. You can see very well that actually does not exist a humus. This is ash. It's an anthropic soil at a huge, huge scale. And this is the first, this, those are the first few millimeters of humus, two or three millimeters. This is the first step to cover this, uh, this soil, this ash. His head now buzzing with new ideas and concrete solutions, Octavian heads back to the capital, back to the heart of politics. He now needs to win over powerful supporters, but it won't be easy 
because environmental protection projects are not money makers in the short term. So why does he sacrifice so much of his time for the common good? What drives me, uh, I, I don't have a proper answer because uh, it came from inside me. Uh, it doesn't mean a lot of effort when I'm doing something that I like it and that I love it and I have such a result. It's uh, fulfilling me with a lot of energy and hope that some, some uh, things, bad things, will be changed in the next, in the future, in the close future. The desert is still advancing in Romania. But it has formidable and creative opponents. First and foremost, Octavian Berceanu. He is determined to fight and protect his homeland against the sand.